Good morning, church. I'm Paige, and I'm so glad you've joined us for worship today. I'm the kids' ministry lead here at Cascade Fellowship, and I have a few friends with me here this morning. This is Bella. Hi. And Maddie. Hi. Our current Cascade Kids series is called How To, and in this series, we've been focusing on how to follow God, and each week, we've kind of been digging into one of Jesus' teachings from the Sermon on the Mount. So, Bella, what are a few things that you've learned during this series? I've learned that Jesus taught us how to make a difference and love our enemies. That's awesome. And how do you think that we can make a difference? By letting people know that we are followers of Jesus and letting it show through the things we say and do. Awesome. And Maddie, do you want to share what we're going to learn in the upcoming weeks? Yeah, we're going to talk about how Jesus teaches us how to pray and how to share with others. Awesome, exactly. And we're going to look at the Lord's Prayer and we're going to talk about having a giving heart. Well, thanks girls for joining me this morning. Our kids up through preschool will be dismissed shortly for a time of their own worship and learning. We know sometimes faith can feel separate from real life and we want to help you learn how the gospel is relevant today and how it implies to your entire life. If you're new here, head down to the Connections Corner in the lobby after the gathering. Our connection team wants to meet you. If you're looking to get connected, whether it's volunteering or joining a grow group or a life group, coming to community nights or diving deeper into the weekly messages, there is something for everyone. Not sure where to start? We will help you. Reach out to Pastor Bill or Pastor Eric or head to cascadefellowship.org connect to explore all of the options. Thanks for joining us this morning for worship. I'm so glad you're here. Well, good morning, church. I want to welcome you into the Upper Worship Center and those that are joining us online. Let's stand and sing praise.
I first heard that song down at a conference at North Point Church um, a while ago. And the way that they introduced it is it was written during COVID. And they said that in times of trouble or uncertainty or um, just comfort, sometimes we turn to songs that we know. And I wonder if many of you recognize lyrics from old hymns that are in that song. And I think that we do do that. I think songs do that, but I think that scripture does that as well. And I think that when we take the opportunity to implant scripture into our daily lives, that when we need it most, we can pull it up. And I think Psalm 62 is one of those great, great psalms that can have that same effect, telling us that we can trust in God, the rock of our salvation, when everything else gives way. So I wanna read that for you right now, Psalm 62. Yes, my soul, find rest in God. My hope comes from him. Truly, he is my rock and my salvation. He is my fortress and I will not be shaken. My salvation and my honor depend on God. He is my mighty rock and my refuge. So trust in him at all times, you people. Pour out your hearts to him, for God is our refuge. And faultless before you, Lord. We stand here because of the great sacrifice of Jesus Christ, our Savior, Lord, and we give you thanks. God, we give you our praise, Lord. We give you our time this morning to come before you, Lord, to lay down our concerns and our burdens, to share with you our joys, Lord, to worship you and to hear from your word, God, and we ask for your presence, Lord. Give us the presence of your Holy Spirit so that we might know you more. 
We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. God does greet us here this morning. He sends us his presence through the power of the Holy Spirit. And I encourage you to greet your neighbors around you. And we're going to wait for our lower worship venue to join us. Good morning, everybody, and welcome. We're so glad that you're here. Very first thing we want to do is dismiss the kids. If you didn't already see the slide, up through preschool today, we're dismissing up through preschool. And everybody else is welcome to stay with us for the service. It's Family Worship Sunday, so it's great to see people of all ages here worshiping together. Uh, hey, my name is Bill. I'm the lead pastor here. If we haven't met yet, welcome. I'm so glad that God has brought you here to worship with us today. Already met a couple new folks, that's always exciting. And if you are new, I'd love to meet you and talk with you, so be sure to hang out after the service and come to the lobby we call the Hub, and we'll connect. Well, we have some very exciting things going on today. It's Family Sunday, as we mentioned, but it's also a Sunday where we get to celebrate the growth of our church family and welcome some new members. So I want to call our latest uh, new members up to the stage at this time, Wilson and Katie Cunha, along with their kids, uh, Matthew, Bella, and Chloe, Tony and Karen Sprague, Dave and Nancy Schapansky, and Eric Rosendahl. So come on up, guys. While they're coming up, I want to encourage everybody, I hope you got a bulletin on your way in today, and if you look on the back, you can see little profiles and pictures of all these folks to get to know them. And so make sure you read that and welcome them and say hi to them in the lobby. Uh, okay, so here's the deal. If you're not blinded, you're not in the light. So step up. <laughs> Keep, we want to see you. Yeah, come over. Come on. Come on. Dave, is, Dave is straggling in the dark over there. There you go. All right, and now I'll find a spot here by Eric. Okay. Uh, man, God is so good to us, uh, bringing so many new people here who are excited and enthused about what we're doing and who are ready to join our mission. And uh, these are just a few. And we'll have more coming up in uh, just a couple weeks as well. But as we welcome these folks into our family, oh, and by the way, I should say this. This is not Lori. This is not Lori Smickley. <laughs> if you know Lori, you might think this is Lori. They, they do a, a, a twin thing, right? Not technically twins, no. but they could be. But they're here in the room at the same time, so they're, they're not the same person. <laughs> so very cool, very cool. Uh, all right, so we're going to welcome these folks into our church family. I've got some questions for you. So I'll read the question, and then you can answer, I do. Let's put the questions on the screen. Do you affirm once again that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, that the Bible is God's word revealing Christ and his redemption, and that the teachings of this church reflect that revelation? And do you promise to join with us, sharing your gifts in our worship and fellowship and in the mission that God has given us in the world? Thank you. And now I want to ask everybody in the congregation to stand. We have a question for you as well. So people of Cascade Fellowship, do you promise to receive these families in love as your brothers and sisters in Christ? Support them with your fellowship and prayers, and recognizing their gifts, invite them into the life and mission of our congregation. All right, thank you. Please be seated. Let's share just a quick uh, prayer to celebrate this moment. God, thank you so much for this beautiful family that you've drawn together and that you've drawn these new folks to be part of this church family. We pray your blessing on them as they integrate into the fellowship and into the service that we offer here. Uh, God, that they might find their place to grow deep roots, to know people well, to be loved and to love well, and to use all the gifts you've given them for your glory here and in the community and in the world. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. 
Would you join me in welcoming these families? Oh, no. A Christian is like... Take two. Hello? Okay. Good morning. Will you join me in prayer? We praise you, God, for who you are, creator of all things good. You are good, holy, loving, faithful, patient, just, gracious, and forgiving. Lord, we know we live in a broken world, and we too are broken before you. Romans 3 tells us that we all sin and fall short of your glory. Thank you, Jesus, for offering yourself so we can stand righteous before the throne of God's grace. God, we're grateful for healing that you bring to those we care about. Lynn Bauman, Nancy Harkema, and Mark Langenbach. Father, we celebrate with Jackie Bramer as she turns 80, and we weep with those who mourn the Grunewalds and Vanderwalls, saying goodbye to their family members. We pray for Anne and Pete Guchis as they conclude their work trip and travel home. Lord, we lift up Stephanie Coops as she continues her long journey, undergoing testing to determine the cause of issues with her liver. We pray for clear answers, direct resolutions, and treatment to be available soon. We pray for those, Lord, living with cancer, and we ask your hand of protection and care upon them. For Evelyn, Elena, Vivian, Bob, and Isais. God, we pray for Kathy Bauman and Al Visbean under the care of hospice. May they see evidence of your love each day. As we break this week from grow groups and some of the Cascade Kids activities, we're thankful for the people who are or have been leading this year. Lynn Bauman, Rebecca Iveson, Lisa Call, Hannah Veldstra, Catherine Gardner, Allison Lamer, Steve Raderink, Anita Atchison, Elsa Vandergraff, Mike and Linda Ozer, Daniel Oyer, Joshua Burr, Jane Rowerda, John Brink, Eric Rosendahl, Wilson Cunha, Dick Hertel, Mark and Melinda Homans, Eric and Christine Vanderwall, staff and volunteers from West Michigan Friendship Center. Each of them give of their time and effort and knowledge and energy. They are dedicated and loving, and we thank you, Lord. We can't help but pause as our hearts broke and stomachs dropped this week with the news from Michigan State and people continue to struggle and suffer in Turkey and Syria, in the Ukraine. Lord, we know it's not your plan for people to suffer. We live in a fallen world. Our hearts are troubled and we groan in pain. Yet we respond with Psalm 34, Father, I sought the Lord and he answered me. He delivered me from all my fears. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in him. Father, may we find ways to take refuge in you. Lord, we lift up Pastor Bill as he leads us in your word. We pray, Lord, that our hearts are transformed, that our lives are spent following and modeling after your son, Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. A Christian is like believing that Jesus died on the cross to save us. A Christian is somebody who loves Jesus. Someone that loves the Lord and knows him. Somebody who believes in God and trusts that he's our savior. And he came to the world to die on the cross and take away our sins. 
to believe in Jesus. I think that a Christian is someone who accepts Jesus as their Lord and Savior. Someone who follows Jesus? It's like someone who, who believes in God. It means that some persons that follow um, Jesus and read the Bible. Um, it's somebody who believes in God. It looks like to follow Jesus by praying to him and being a good leader of other people. Um, to do the right thing. You tell more people about him and you read the Bible to read the Bible and follow his word. Going to church like every single weekend, always taking notes in church and uh, volunteering to do stuff. It's to believe in God and um, pray to him. To follow God and to pray um, and read the Bible. To um, pray, to learn about God and worship him. If like he tells you to do something and it's really hard, you still do it because you know he has a plan for you. To worship him. To worship him and praise him. To trust in him. All right, can we show some appreciation to our kids? What a great job. Well, I am a Christian. That's the name of today's message. And I just want to thank the kids again. Thanks to everybody who participated. I think you've made my job really, really easy this morning. You know, you've made my sermon a lot shorter. Thank you. It's just basically what they said. You know, let's play the video again. We can all go out and get in the buffet line a little earlier today, right? No, but seriously, today's sermon is going to be a little bit different. It's Family Sunday, uh, hopefully a little shorter, unless things go off the wire here. But uh, it's going to be a little shorter, a little more fun, a little more interactive. And it's all around this question, I am a Christian. The statement, I am a Christian. It's a statement that I make. I'm a Christian. Many of you here this morning would make that same statement as well. And there's some, some here we just want to say that, you know, you don't make that statement yet. You are not to that place where you would say, I'm a Christian. And, uh, and that's fine. We're like, welcome. We are so glad that you're here exploring Christianity, exploring what faith means. And uh, we want to welcome you here. You know, just this week, we were in a meeting looking at uh, the names of people who are coming to faith. We have people here in our church coming to faith for the first time or, or taking first steps in the faith. And so we want to welcome you. Like, we are so glad you're on that journey with us. But listen, no matter where you are on that continuum, when you see this statement, I am a Christian, some things come to your mind. Some things come to all of our minds. And it might be something like this. You think a Christian, increasingly today, that means it's some sort of political identity, some sort of political tribe that you identify with. In other words, more and more today, when you hear somebody say, I'm a Christian, sometimes they don't mean barely anything religious by that. What they mean is, I identify with like-minded voters and I vote in a certain way. I'm part of a voting block, I'm part of an identity. That's what it means for me to say I'm a Christian. For others, it's just a cultural identity. It's like, well, hey, this is America, and America, that's what we are, we're, we're Christians, right? I mean. I guess that's what I am. I'm, I'm not a Hindu. I'm not Islamic. I'm not a Muslim. I'm not a Buddhist. I, I guess I'm Christian. That's what some people mean. It's like a, a cultural thing for them when they say, I'm a Christian. Or maybe for you, you know, you think about your past experiences with Christians, and when you, when you see this word, you think really good things. Like you think, man, there have been people in my life who've said, I'm a Christian, and they have helped me. They've been kind to me. They've been loving toward me. And that's what you think. You think, man, that's, that's great. And there's also some people who might have just the opposite experience. And that is when you hear someone say, I'm a Christian, you say, look out, because in my past, every time I've heard someone say that, they've ended up being a hypocrite, and I've been burned by their hypocrisy, their hatred, their selfishness, uh, their, their hate toward me. And so, listen, it's a super important question to ask what Christianity is all about, what it means to say these important, powerful words, I am a Christian. 
That's what we're going to try to get to the bottom of today. And I hope that by the time you leave, no matter what age you are, you're going to have a great answer to this question and know what you mean when you say, I am a Christian. So for this morning, we have one simple verse to guide our discussion, and it's 1 Peter 2, 9. Peter says, but you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his wonderful light. So much great things tucked away into this one verse. We're going to begin picking it apart today. But before we do that, we always pray that God would help us understand his word. So would you join me in prayer? Well, God, thank you for speaking to us through your word today and every day. And we just want to humble ourselves before it now. So God, whether we've been following Jesus for one month or 70 years or anywhere in between, we still have to humble ourselves before you as your spirit teaches us. There's always more to learn. There's always room to grow. And I pray especially, God, for the youngest years in the room today. I pray you'll give them ears to hear what it means to be a Christian. And I pray you'll work even now in these moments to draw them to yourself and to create faith in their hearts. I pray also for those who don't yet call themselves Christians and I pray you'll give them ears to hear the message this morning, too. For all of us, God, help us see the glory of Christ. Help us see his goodness. Help us proudly carry his name and carry it well. And we pray all of this in the name of Jesus. Amen. All right, so as we begin this morning, I want to give you a heads up. We're taking a little one-week break from our series, Rooted. And so this, this talk is not officially part of the Rooted series, which is going through the Heidelberg Catechism. And yet, uh, the Heidelberg Catechism offers some really, really helpful wording that will help us answer the question this morning. So I'm going to quote the Heidelberg Catechism a little bit. And here's how I'd like to start us thinking about the question today. We're, we're seeking to answer this question, what is a Christian and I want to make the case to you that in order to answer this question, you have to answer this question. Who is Christ? What is a Christian? Well, who is Christ? And the Heidelberg Catechism shows that link between those two things really, really clearly. And so it's very helpful to us. So let's just do a quick overview of some of the concepts we're going to talk about this morning. Uh, Q&A 29, why is the Son of God called Jesus, meaning Savior? Because he saves us from our sins, and because salvation should not be sought and cannot be found anywhere else. So one of the first things the catechism would teach us about being a Christian is that we're following Jesus, and right there in his very name is who he is. He is a Savior, Jesus, the Lord saves, Savior, right in his name. And so if we are a Christian, one of the first things that is acknowledging when we say I'm a Christian is acknowledging that Jesus is my Savior, that he is saving me, that he has saved me. But then the catechism goes on. So there's, there's Jesus Christ. So what does Christ mean? Why is he called Christ? Meaning anointed. And again, we'll just pause to note that the question itself kind of gives the answer, right? So Christ means anointed. Uh, Christ is not his last name, by the way, just a reminder for all of us. Jesus is his name, which means Savior. And Christ is his title, which is kind of like his job description, sort of, and it means anointed. Christ was anointed to do several things. Because he has been ordained by God the Father and has been anointed with the Holy Spirit to be, first, our chief prophet and teacher, who fully reveals to us the secret counsel and will of God concerning our deliverance. So Jesus is anointed to be a prophet, chief prophet. He's also anointed to be, secondly, our only high priest, who has delivered us by the one sacrifice of his body and who continually pleads our cause with the Father. And then third, he's anointed to be our eternal king, who governs us by his word and spirit and who guards us and keeps us in the freedom he has won for us. So did you take note of those words I underlined? They're going to be super important for this morning's talk. Christ is anointing, he's anointed to be three things, our prophet, priest, and king. 
Now, that answers who Jesus is. He's the Savior who's anointed and called, a very important task. Now, who are we? Who are Christians? Who are Christ's followers? Let's look at the link here, question and answer 32. But why are you called a Christian? Because by faith, I'm a member of Christ. And so I share in his anointing. I'm anointed to confess his name. That sounds a lot like a prophet, right? To confess his name. To present myself to him as a living sacrifice of thanks. That sounds a lot like a priest. And to strive with free conscience against sin and the devil in this life. And afterward to reign with Christ over all creation for eternity. Did you notice that? The catechism is so smart in pointing this out, right? Jesus has this calling, this anointing to be prophet, priest, and king. And so we as Christians are united with him, and we share in that same calling to be prophets, priests, and kings. Okay, so that's a preview of where we're headed this morning. To map it out visually, Jesus Christ. Jesus means Savior. Christ means the anointed one. And he is anointed to be our prophet, our priest, and our king. Does that much make sense so far? Okay. Now, as Christians, we are saved by Jesus, and we are anointed with the same anointing that he is to be prophets, priests, and kings. Okay. Now, with all that said, that's kind of an overview for where we're headed this morning. It's kind of heady, I know, but let's get into that verse and begin to pick this apart, where this is found in Scripture. And I actually think all of those things are found right in the Scripture itself, in this one Scripture, in fact. So, Peter says, but you are a chosen people. Let's just pause there to note that this indicates something really, really important about salvation and how God works. And that is this. God initiated salvation. He chose you to be saved. He chose you. It's all throughout the Bible. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 7. Uh, to the Old Testament people of God, these words, for you are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you out of all the peoples on the face of the earth to be his people, his treasured possession. The Lord did not set his affection on you and choose you because you were more numerous than the other peoples, for you were the fewest of all peoples, but it was because the Lord loved you. And so this is how God works throughout the Bible, is he, uh, not based on how good you are, not based on how well you've done, not based on how worthy you are, the way God operates is he chooses you because he loves you to be saved, to enter into his family. And that's where this discussion starts this morning. If you're going to say, I am a Christian, then you are saying, Jesus saves. I believe that Jesus is the Savior. That's one of the things you mean when you say, I'm a Christian. But it's more personal than just Jesus saves. It's Jesus has saved me. That's part of what it means to be a Christian. That's an important part of what it means to be a Christian, to say, I'm a Christian. But look, Jesus, he saved us, and that wasn't the end of the story, but Jesus saved us, and then he has set us on this path, walking with him and living for him on this mission in his world. And so the next things we read talk about that mission. You're a chosen people, a royal priesthood. Does that sound familiar? This is one of the words that we read earlier. You are a priesthood. Notice, look, it says you. That's you, right? That's you. And if you're, you're sitting here, and maybe you're a young person or, or an older person, and you're thinking, Bill, what is that, what is that verse trying to say? Like, no, you're, you're, the, you're the pastor of this church. Uh, pastor Bill is pastor. Uh, pastor Bill's minister. Pastor Bill's preacher. So why are you telling me I'm a priest? What is that about? Uh, well, yeah, that's the Bible's message. Is It's sometimes called the priesthood of all believers. If you're a believer, if you're in Christ, you are a priest. Uh, okay, so what does that mean? What does it mean when I look at in this crowd and every single face I see, if you're in Christ, you're a priest? What does that mean? Well, I've shown this picture before. This is what the Old Testament priesthood looked like. This is from a, a replica tabernacle in uh, Israel. And we've got a big old group going this year, and you all are going to see this in person. But this is, this is what the Old Testament priesthood looked like. So remember, kids, they kind of wore these colorful and, you know, funny-looking kind of things. And they had a really important special task. Let's remember back to the Old Testament, right? Not just anybody willy-nilly could just walk into the tabernacle or the temple, those inner rooms. 
but it was just a select few people, descendants of a specific person, Levi. So if you wanted to be a priest, you had to be a descendant of Levi, and you had to be called and chosen, and, and the priests did a lot of different things. But at the end of the day, their chief role was that priests made sacrifices and represented the people before God. That's what they did in the Old Testament, and now Peter is writing to us in the New Testament and saying, that's you now. So kids, adults, everybody in the room, that's you now. You are a priest. Where is that in the Bible? What are we talking about here? The book of Hebrews spells this out really clearly, Hebrews 10. Therefore, brothers and sisters, that's us, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with the full assurance that faith brings. Uh, in this passage, the writer of Hebrews is making it crystal clear that we, now we don't have to, you know, have somebody else enter into the Holy of Holies for us, but we have confidence to enter right in to the holy place and draw near to God, just like the priests did. And we're also we're offering sacrifices, chapter 13. Through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice. What's that sacrifice? It's, we're not sacrificing bulls and lambs and goats and things here, are we? No, we're, we're offering a different kind of sacrifice, the sacrifice of praise, the fruit of lips that openly profess his name and do not forget to do good and to share with others. For with such sacrifices, God is pleased. Look at what the New Testament says our sacrifice is. It's a few things. It's the fruit of lips. In other words, it's words. And it's also doing good and sharing with others. Those are the sacrifices the new priests make, that you and I make. So here's the truth for all of us today. If you're saying, I'm a Christian, what you're saying is, I'm a priest. You're, and this is the truth. You are a priest. Okay, so I need a volunteer to come up. Any age will do. But Probably elementary school or above, which is good because we dismissed the preschoolers, so that should work. Anybody want to come up? <laughs> come on up. <laughs> okay, you're going to do perfect because this is going to require some stamina. You're the first volunteer, and you're going to be up here for a while. Are you okay with that? Uh, yeah, sure. <laughs> okay, great. And uh, why don't you introduce yourself to everybody? Hi, I'm Matthew. All right, what grade are you in? Six. All right, wonderful. What do you want to be when you grow up? A soccer player. All right, very cool. Well, guess what you're also going to be? A priest. Hey, look at this. <laughs> this. This guy. He's listening. Okay, so we're going to have you, uh, we're going to have you do a motion that shows what a priest would do, okay? And uh, you're going to stand here for a while, and we're going to add the other parts next to you. Okay. So get ready, okay? So come on over here. And let's say, what does a priest do? A priest intercedes on behalf of people, stands between the people and God. So you're going to pray, do whatever you do when you pray. Like, I don't know. That's great. That's great. All right. Stay just like that. And that is being a priest. Okay. Let's see what else we are, right? So we're going to add to that. Listen, you are not just a priesthood. You are a royal priesthood. Wow. What, what does that add to our understanding? What does it mean to be a royal priesthood? Well, similarly, in the Old Testament, not just anybody could be a king. Of course, you had to be a descendant of this guy, David. This is a statue cropped for, uh, for Family Sunday. And <laughs> the readers, <laughs> I saw you look. Saw you. Uh, the readers in the, the first century, as they read uh, Peter's letter, you know, they would be thinking about this through Jewish, uh, a Jewish lens and saying, yeah, I can't imagine being king. I'm not a descendant of David. There's one king at a time. That's wild to even think about. Or even for non-Jewish people, they'd think about the Roman emperor. And wow, that's just unfathomable to say that I'm royal or that I'm a king. Similarly today, I can't imagine being a king. I don't follow the royal family in England very much, but I don't think I could just walk in there and they would like accept me as one of their own and put me on the throne. And yet, that's what this book of the Bible is saying, and the Bible is saying about us, we are royalty. So what did kings do in the Old Testament? They ruled on God's behalf. They worked for good in the world. They worked to implement God's will in the world. And really, if you think about it, God gave this task not just to one or two people, but to all of us in the beginning. Go all the way back with me to Genesis chapter 1. So God created mankind in his own image, all of us, 
God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it, and look at this, rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. From the very beginning, God's will for us, his people, was that we would be created in his image, and part of being in his image is ruling on his behalf, is is being present in his creation to implement his will for his creation. And at the very end of the story, if you flip near the last page of your Bible, you'll see this, that that's his will for us in the end as well. They will be priests of God and Christ and will reign with him for a thousand years. There's that word again. So listen, that is God's plan for us from the beginning to the end. We've really made a mess of it here in the middle, but it's still God's will for us, for us to be royalty. So when you say you're a Christian, that's part of the answer, that you are royalty. I need a second volunteer. Who do we have? Come on up. All right, wonderful. All right, let's do the same thing. Come over here in the light for a second, and uh, let's introduce yourself here. Uh, I am Eli. I'm in seventh grade. Awesome. What do you want to be when you grow up? I don't really know. Okay, well, we got an answer for you today. What are you going to be now? Are you going to be a king uh, or just a royal somebody? Yeah. A royal. Okay, that sounds good. He, he's going to be a royal somebody. So we need some kind of pose to illustrate that you are a, a royalty. All right, so let's borrow. Does anybody, I'm not, I'm not in like children's ministry. I don't know how to do this. So uh, let's say this is a scepter. This is your king's scepter, and you're going to stand like this at the people and look at them like that, Okay. There you go. Now let's stand over here. Come on over here. Great. All right. What wonderful, what wonderful actors we have this morning. The pressure is on for whoever's number three. <laughs> All right. Continuing on, one last piece of the puzzle. If we read farther into our key verse this morning, you're a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession. And why, why has God done all of this so that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his wonderful light. What does that verb remind us of? The fact that God has tasked us with declaring who he is to the world. That should remind us of prophets. Think back to the Old Testament and you see prophets like this calling the people to repentance, continually reminding them of God's will, exhorting them to obey, declaring the goodness of God. Prophets in the Old Testament declared God's word. And that is our job now as prophets. Look at the Great Commission. Go, therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. We are all tasked with being a prophet, in other words, sharing who God is with his world. When you say you're a Christian, here's what you're saying. You're a prophet. Last volunteer, who, who is going to come up? I saw your hand first. Come on up. All right. Wonderful. Are you hanging in there? You doing all right? Kind of. Kind of. <laughs> We're almost, you're almost done. Somebody needs to take a picture of this. This is wonderful. Look at this. All right. Come on up. So, you know, let's inter- <laughs> there, are they doing something over there? All right, let's introduce yourself. Um, I'm Izzy. I'm eighth grade. All right, wonderful. You are going to, well, let's ask you first, do you, do you have any plans for your life? Do you, know, do you have it all figured out yet? I want to be a first responder. Oh, okay. That's wonderful. And do you get to be a? Prophet. A prophet. Okay. <laughs> let's think about what that means together. It means to proclaim right? It means to proclaim who God is. So let's create a motion for that. How about if you like act like you're shouting like this? Does that look good? Okay, now let's do that right over here. And that, my friends, is a picture of what it means to be a Christian. So a prophet, a priest, and a king. Jesus is what he is, his calling is, his anointing is to be a prophet, a priest, and a king, or as we see over here, a prophet. Let's have you all switch order, you two. Come over here. Yes, priest, a prophet, a priest, and a king. Right, a prophet, a priest, and a king. That's who Jesus was, and that's who we are as well. In him, we are joined with him 
mystically part of him, and we share in his anointing, we share in his calling. And so we also are prophets, priests, and kings. So I want to make this super participatory for everybody here this morning. I want everybody to enjoy the fact that we are all prophets. Can everybody make this symbol and say, I am a prophet? prophet. (laughs) You all look so ridiculous. That's beautiful. Thank you. We should do this every week. (laughs) And and how about this? I am a priest. So uh, let's get our hands folded. I am a priest. Okay, and finally, I am a king. king. All right, let's give them one final round of applause. Thank you so much. Thank you, guys. Our drummer will need his scepter later. We'll put that right back. (laughs) And so that, my friends, is what I think it means when you say, I am a Christian. It it looks like this. First of all, remember what we said Jesus means Savior. So when you say I'm a Christian, it means, listen, I accept Jesus as my Savior. I am saved. But it also means that he is calling me to share in his calling. He is calling me to follow after him. And he is these things, prophet, priest, and king. And so I am also, in a certain sense, a prophet, a priest, and a king. So real quick for application this morning, just look at each of those four things with me. First, means, first thing we're going to talk about with application is simply this. Do you accept Jesus as your Savior and your only hope of being saved? Here's the deal, kids, adults, everyone in between. Uh, I have made a royal mess of my life. I'm a sinner. And if you're honest, so have you. <laughs> and we all stand before God falling short, way, way, way short of his holy standard for our lives. And we need somebody to stand in our place to take the punishment we deserve. And Jesus is that Savior. And listen, the Bible's message is clear. Part of being a Christian is trusting Jesus and Jesus alone for salvation. So that doesn't mean 50-50, like I'm going to trust myself a little bit and I'm going to trust Jesus a little bit. It doesn't even mean 99-1%. I trust Jesus 99%, but I, I still trust myself just a little bit. But faith that saves us is faith that's totally 100% trusting in Jesus alone as the Savior. Now, next application point, what does it mean to share in his calling, to follow him in his calling? What's it mean to be a prophet? Well, as we said, that means announcing and proclaiming and spreading the news of who God is. And so I want to encourage everybody here, no matter what age you are, to be thinking this question, how am I going to share who Jesus is where I am. And that can be a first grade classroom or eighth grade on the, wherever you do resor- recess up here when it snows, I don't know. Uh, wherever God takes you, how can you spread the news about who he is? Think about that. A priest, what does that mean? It means to make a sacrifice of praise with your entire life and to intercede on behalf of people to pray. And so kids, listen, if you're going to be serious about saying, I'm a Christian, I'm a Christ follower, and I'm following Christ, as a priest, you got to set aside time to pray. You've got to set aside time in your life, maybe every time before dinner or every time before bed or whenever. And you got to pray for your friends and you got to pray for people around the world who need your prayers to intercede and be a priest. And then finally, a king. Uh, listen, this is like super important to mention here. When God says that you're royalty and you're going to reign with God for all eternity, we have to remember what that means and we have to remember what that looks like Jesus came as a king. Jesus came to rule and reign, but how did he come? He came in a manger, right? He came riding lowly and on a donkey toward the end of his life. Jesus was a ruler with a kind heart who put others above himself and ruled as a servant. And so I want to encourage everybody here again, as you're following Jesus, if you're a Christian, a Christ follower, what does it look like to rule and reign the way that he does, to bring some good into the world, into your corner of the world, whatever that is? So if you're a business owner, what does it look like for you to bring a little bit of good into your business? If you're into venture capital, what does that look like to bring a little bit of good into that area of God's world? If you're in second grade, what does that look like to bring a little bit of God's goodness into your corner of his world? That, my friends, is what it means when we say, I am a Christian. And I want us to think about that as a whole church, man. Can you just imagine with me the implications of what this means? 
that everybody in the room, no matter who you are, where you are, what age you are, you now know your core identity that nobody can take away from you. That you are a prophet in God's eyes, that you're a priest in God's eyes, that you're a king in God's eyes, that you have something really important to do with your life, no matter what your calling in life is, whether you're an architect. No, you're an architect, but you're also a prophet, a priest, and a king, right? Uh, No matter what you're doing with your life, you are a prophet, a priest, and a king. You're a student. Yes, you are, but you're also a prophet, a priest, and a king. Man, let's all enjoy the the certainty that comes in living with and for Jesus by embracing our identity. Let's pray about that. God, many of us here in the room, we say these words, I am a Christian. We don't think that often about what it really means. And so today, I, I pray you'll help us to spend some time thinking really deeply about what it means not only to be saved by Christ, but to also follow after him and to walk the path that he wants us to walk, to share in his anointing, to share in his calling, just like he's a prophet for us to be a prophet, just like he's a priest for us to be a priest, and just like he's a king for us to be royalty. God, help us as we seek to fulfill this calling you've given us for this life. We love you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Will you stand and close the service in song with us?
Thank you for being here, everybody. Uh, what a great morning. Uh, so, so well-behaved all the kids are, right? We talked about some pretty heavy-duty theology this morning. Thank you all for paying attention. And uh, listen, a little bit of insider talk here. Like, I know this is a lot, and not everybody's going to remember everything I say. That's totally cool. My goal as your pastor is to give you the tools to keep on having these discussions yourself. And so now you know, maybe around your dinner table this week, some great things to talk about. What does it mean, Jesus Christ, Jesus is Savior? What does that mean? What does it mean, Christ, he's anointed to these tasks? What does that mean? And you have this resource available to you, the Heidelberg Catechism, Q&A 31 and 32, to guide those discussions, to keep on talking about these things, to keep on applying these things. That's my goal for everybody. Uh, we do make some resources available for you as you do that. You can find them all on our website at cascadefellowship.org slash rooted. And a final reminder that, hey, at Cascade, we don't pass a plate or anything, but giving is still a very important part of our worship. God asks that uh, we not hold back any part of our life from him and that we support his work in this world. And so if you'd like to contribute to us financially, you'll find a giving station on your way out. Or you can text 84321 with any amount or scan the QR code in your bulletin. Again, thanks for being here, everybody. Uh, I'll meet you in the hub, and I look forward to talking with you more. In the meantime, let me send you out of this room with this blessing. Go in the grace, love, and peace of our God, who's Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.